Okay, so thank you so much for coming. I'm Melanie Conroy. I'm the interim director of the Marcus W. Orr Center for the uh, Center for the Humanities at the University of Memphis. Um, and thank you so much for coming to the roundtable publishing in the pandemic. Um, so we have uh, three panelists. Um, Jimmy Thomas from the Center of, of the Study of Southern Culture from Ole Miss. Liz Lane um, from English at the University of Memphis, uh, who's the co-founder of Spark Journal and Remy Debs, who's Associate Professor and Chair of Philosophy, and he's also the uh, editor of the Southern Journal of Philosophy. Um, today's conversation will be moderated by me, um, Melanie Conrad, I'm from World Lang uh, Languages, and William Duffy um, from English. Um, but after we've had um, some time um, for the panelists to share their perspective and share their advice with us um, for how to get uh, work out there and published, um, we're gonna welcome uh, questions from the audience. Um, so if you do have a question, um, feel free to hang on to it. And then in the last 15-20 um, minutes, we should have um, plenty of time um, for all of your questions. Um, so to get started, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists um, to give us uh, some of their experience and um, some of their um, uh, some of their perspectives on publishing. Uh, we all know that publishing has changed a lot in recent years um, with the rise of the internet and the digital. Uh, we also know that there's, um, for academics, there's a lot more pressure to publish. But there's also a lot more venues. Um, so that's why we've uh, invited um, people from a variety of different um, kinds of publications with a variety of experience um, to talk about um, uh, their experience um, as publishing as authors and also the kinds of things um, that they're looking for as editors. Um, so, uh, Jimmy, would you be able to say a few words about your experience and perspective? Yeah, uh, you guys invite me, having me here. Um, to give you some background on my editing experience, <clears throat> I started work as, a, as doing editorial work here in Oxford in the late 90s with the local newspaper, the Oxford Eagle. Um, after having worked with them for a number of years, I moved to New York and did editorial work and writing for magazines um, there. Um, wanted to return back here. I'm from Mississippi originally. Had gone to the University of Mississippi um, as a um, a student and I came back here and began doing uh, academic publishing and uh, editorial work as managing editor for the uh, 24 volume new encyclopedia of Southern yeah. culture um, here which we produced at the center it depends um, on the internship so since then um, I've worked on uh, both uh, editions of the Mississippi Encyclopedia as an editor. Uh, first, we started with a, it was a print. It's a print uh, encyclopedia. Um, and now I'm one of two editors for the online Mississippi Encyclopedia. Um, I'm also an editor for Study the South, which is uh, the center's um, online uh, scholarly journal. Um, I do other kinds of editorial work from uh, editing our uh, news magazine, the Center's news magazine, the Southern Register, to working with Jay Watson here in the English department on the series. It's a book series. Um, I've worked on a number of different um, standalone books from the Center and my own work as well. And um, I'm on some editorial boards with the Southern Quarterly, uh, published at the University of Southern Mississippi, and um, I'm on Mississippi. So all of that is really just to say I've worked editorial, editorially um, on a number of different projects, types of projects everything from newspapers to mostly scholarly works, um, but across that range. And, and also, as you said, Melanie, um, 
publishing is really changing. And um, so, yeah, a couple of online projects as well that I'm working on today, uh, still. Well, literally today, actually. <laughs> We're publishing a new um, entry or essay in Study of the South today. Um, so, yeah, so that's that. Oh, and I teach research writing and research methods here at the university as well. So Great. Yeah. Do you have some me. general <laughs> advice for people getting started? Because you've done so much, right? We can't all do that much. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's exhausting. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think so. I think um, young scholars, like I mentioned, I do, um, I still work on encyclopedia projects. And encyclopedia projects are easy ways to, I shouldn't say easy, but they are accessible ways for young scholars to uh, not only publish, but to kind of claim a, a topic in a sense, um, become an, an authority at least on a specific topic. Um, it's a great way to add to a CV that one might be building. Um, you know, and, and the encyclopedia projects both, uh, one was published by University of North Carolina Press, um, the other by the University Press of Mississippi. So they are scholarly um, publishers as well. So they do get vetted um, through a, a, a peer review process um, in a sense. But yeah, I, I think finding ways to publish early on um, is important. And, and the second thing I'll say on that is I really recommend um, students uh, not, well, to write papers as if you hope to publish them. I think, you know, students write papers, you know, you write a 20 page paper and you turn it in and you do well on it and that's done and you put it in a drawer. And I think um, there's so many opportunities to turn those papers um, into publishable papers. Most people who um, you're, they will work with uh, professors and get good feedback. Um, so yeah, I, I, those are the two things that I'd start off the bat and just recommending. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so now, uh, Liz Lane, would you be able to speak for a few minutes about your experience and um, maybe some general advice that you have? Sure, absolutely. Um, hey everyone, I'm Liz Lane, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of English at University of Memphis. Um, specifically, I teach technical writing uh, and document design classes. Classes kind of focused on design and rhetoric in some sense. Um, so I am going to tell you a little bit about the Spark Journal, which is still relatively new. Um, it, it has a bit of history and I feel like that history is important to explain to give you a bit of the context. Um, so Spark is an online only digital uh, open access peer reviewed journal. Um, you can find this at sparkactivism.com. And it emerged out of a grassroots initiative um, from graduate students in Indiana. Um, I was a graduate student at Purdue University and back in 2013, 2014, there was a statewide debate um, around LGBTQ rights and um, specifically businesses' rights to choose to serve or deny service to LGBTQ individuals. Um, so there were a series of actions and events that we organized around that, specifically leading up to a large conference in the field of writing studies, um, the Four Cs Conference, Conference on College Composition and Communication. Um, and after we had kind of started some grassroots initiative, with that conference as it moved to different cities around the country to kind of raise awareness about local community issues. Uh, and we, when I say we, I mean fellow graduate students, um, we kind of realized that there needed to be some kind of record or some kind of outlet for people to write about and share similar experiences that they did surrounding community activism, uh, grassroots activism, and kind of the overlap between writing studies, pedagogy, um, and scholarship. There are a few outlets uh, in my field of writing studies that might be related to that, but we really felt the need that there was something that could be more responsive, um, could have a quick turnaround time for publication, and could be openly available to anyone who wanted to access it. So that's kind of the, the genesis for Spark. And so in 2017, uh, my co-managing editor and I, who actually 
Uh, Jimmy is uh, one of your colleagues at University of Mississippi, uh, Dr. Don Unger. Um, he was a fellow graduate student uh, with me. Um, we actually decided to send out a CFP um, to the field at large in 2017, asking basically for stories of activism and community engagement. Um, and we wanted people to write about what they were doing, uh, to share ideas and perspectives, to share resources. And we got a really interesting response from across the country and from a variety of institutions and people at various levels of their careers. Um, and so we self-published a zine in 2017. Uh, it was called Writing Networks for Social Justice. Um, and that eventually led to what is now Spark Journal. Um, what happened was um, a scholar in community publishing in the writing and rhetoric uh, field took note of that. And this scholar had um, an independent press called New City Community Press and a book series called Writing and Working for Change. Um, and so that scholar approached us and said, hey, I really think y'all should keep this going um, and pretty much gave us the support and kind of the push to take the bold step of founding a journal, basically, which at the time, my co-managing editor and I, we were both pre-tenure faculty, uh, we still are, and uh, we were just kind of nervous about that. But um, again, we felt the need for some kind of digital outlet where people could share experiences. Um, and so in 2018, we had our first um, issue published of Spark Journal. Um, we, we work in volumes. So right now we have two volumes and three issues, uh, basically. And again, you can see those online at sparkactivism.com. Um, and we've grown. Uh, we have an editorial collective, um, which is sort of like an editorial board. Um, and that is made up of nine scholars from across institutions and across uh, our field. And we also have an advisory board, which is um, more advanced scholars in the field. Um, and those folks are also across the country and vary in institutional type. Um, and so we kind of operate on this very coalitional democratic model. Um, even though I'm a co-managing editor and there are two of us, we're basically in the interest of keeping the journal running day to day. Um, We've had various graduate students help us out um, over uh, different semesters and summers. Um, and basically, we're, we're listening to our editorial uh, collective and our advisory board and just the field at large to figure out how we can adapt and respond to what the field needs. Um, so, for example, when I say we've grown, uh, we now have a podcast that has come on board with Spark Journal. Um, it's from a scholar who is out in California at University of California, Merced. Uh, the podcast is called Creating Coalitional Gestures, and it's a podcast about uh, indig Black, Indigenous, and women of color in the field of writing studies. Um, we've also partnered with the blog Teacher Scholar Activist to do uh, a year-long blog series talking about this very memorable and strange year um, as it relates to pedagogy, uh, community engagement, scholarship, activism. So that's, I think, I hope that gives you a good idea of what Spark is all about. Our mission is to be a responsive and somewhat timely publication outlet um, for people in the field. And we also publish things that are slightly different. Um, because we grew from that initial zine, um, our genres of things we publish look a lot like what you might see in a zine or magazine. Uh, so for example, we, uh, so we ask for pieces that are columns, scene reports, interviews, media reviews, and they're all relatively short. They're about 2,500 words. Uh, that's kind of the ballpark that we aim for. And we really encourage folks to submit multimodal material, um, things that have lots of images and resources that people can download and use themselves. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we publish. And actually, I'm gonna give a shout out to Dr. Elizabeth Bador, who's here on the call today. She had a piece published in um, our volume two uh, issue, which came out, oh look, she has a sticker right there from the journal. <laughs> um, her piece came out in volume two this summer, uh, which was a special issue on Black Studies in the uh, commemoration of 50 years of Black Studies programs and curriculum in America. Um, so that is Spark in a nutshell. And I'm happy to say a lot more and answer questions about it, but I feel like that long history is important to kind of tell you where we started and what it is now. Do you have some advice for people <laughs> um, just starting out? You kind of, um, you mentioned that you were pre-tenure. Um, is this, um, you know, um, 
get granted the amount of uncertainty around this year. Um, has this year been something where you're excited by the amount of activism out there and the amount of stuff to talk about? Um, or, you know, how has the, um, the renewed interest in activism this year impacted um, your, um, your uh, publishing path? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I feel like uh, it feels like every few weeks, my co-managing editor and I are checking back in uh, because we have this blog series that we're publishing with Teacher Scholar Archivists. And I feel like each month, each post that we've published has drastically changed in topic or you know, things have just evolved over the course of the year. Um, and so we're finding really interesting connections between what people are writing about. And yeah, we have a current CFP uh, that is circulating and um, it's, it's due December 5th, which is going to be a really interesting time, uh, you know, in the next couple of months, uh, depending on, you know, what happens uh, in, in the world. Um, so I think, uh, and we've had some really good response with that, uh, you know, which is what you want to see. Um, but we've, we've definitely had interest in folks uh, expressing interest in writing about, you know, what's happening right now. And that's going to be difficult to write about because things continue to change. But again, that's why we feel like, yeah, as a digital journal, um, you know, that we kind of have that flexibility. Um, as far as advice I would give to people, um, you know, I, I was thinking about when I was first exploring publishing, and I think the best piece of advice I would give would be uh, be bold uh, and cast as wide of a net as you feel comfortable, um, but really do your research and make sure that your work and the places you're interested in publishing are a good fit. I remember um, early on as a graduate student, I would just send pieces out uh, and not really know if they would fit well or not within a certain outlet. Um, and, you know, just be more decisive about what you look into and what you choose to send uh, pieces to. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so Remy Debs, do you have a few um, uh, quick kind of summary of, of your history in publishing as an author and editing and then uh, advice that you have So I started editing first in, uh, volumes for uh, scholarly works. I did a volume for um, Oxford University Press on the history of the concept of dignity. And then I helped edit a volume, uh, co-edited a volume for Cambridge University Press on uh, a niche area in ethics called uh, sentimentalism. And those are my first experiences editing. And I think editing scholarly volumes like that is a creature unto itself. And quite unlike editing a journal, which I have now been doing continuously for a few years. Um, the, when it comes to the journal, I began doing that uh, I guess three years ago. And uh, at that time, we had been picked up. So this is a journal, uh, the Southern Journal of Philosophy has been published by the Department of Philosophy for over 50 years now. And it's a prestigious journal with an acceptance rate that hovers between 10 and 15%. So um, it remains very competitive. And it also holds a niche spot in the field because it's a pluralist journal. So in philosophy, like most disciplines, um, there are various divides and, you know, these can be um, sometimes um, pretty sharp. Uh, and in philosophy, the one that divides and has divided philosophy the longest is between so-called analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. Um, but our journal publishes from all both of those two fields and backgrounds, as well as articles in the history of philosophy and sometimes even in logic. And in that regard, there's only a few journals really out there in the English speaking world that tries to, to do all of those things which makes the task of editing rather difficult, obviously, because nobody can be a specialist of all those different fields. Um, so it's a behemoth job um, uh, for which I, I've enjoyed it, but um, it, it takes, I think, as all the editors here would agree, kind of constant attention, right? It's sort of always on, on, on your mind because it, it needs a little ushering all the time. And uh, I've developed a few special projects for the journal, uh, special series, and you know those things help the help journals they help draw new attention new readers but that takes creative energy away from whatever say your own research is um and uh the journal also publishes a special supplemental volume for the annual conference which occurs here at the Univ university of memphis called the spindel conference which is a uh a big one that draws experts from around the world and then the proceedings are published in a, in a special volume uh, this will be the first year, actually, um, 
that this but that won't take place at the University of Memphis live. Uh, so it's a, it'll break a 35 year continuous uh, stream. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about editing per se if if that's where the conversation goes. I, I would say that my my one of my big pieces of advice for young authors is not to edit, um, to to stay away from requests to edit, um, especially to edit scholarly volumes. Uh, they uh, take a huge amount of work, and they serve mostly the publisher. Um, the big academic publishing houses make a lot of money off of these volumes because each time they publish one, the libraries, big libraries, are almost compelled to purchase them. But the payback for the editor is very small, uh, scholarly speaking. Um, even if you have a chapter in the volume, most uh, people are going to discount that chapter slightly. Uh, certainly your tenure promotion committee will because it's in a, in, in a volume by your own name. Um, and, uh, and it takes, uh, it, again, it takes away time that you might be giving to your own research. So careful about it. Um, especially scholarly volumes. Um, they can be great networking op op opportunities. And certainly once you are an established scholar, I think they can be very helpful to a field and help you define yourself. But um, similar to what Jimmy said, uh, I thought the idea of you know trying to find smaller ways to begin building your reputation through encyclopedia kinds of uh, articles is one way to get a foothold in and start to carve a, a name out for yourself. Um, the other thing I would say just very generally when it comes to young authors who are, are beginning is that they should, as uh, Liz said, make sure that, that where they were putting your piece is a fit with the journal. Um, I don't think enough authors think about fit and sometimes their articles can sit in a period where it's going through review, even the desk review period, which can take sometimes 30, 60 and in COVID days longer because there's a, a backlog. So you could have an article sitting in a desk review up to three months before it gets rejected simply because it doesn't fit. Um, and, and that would be a waste of your precious time. So thinking about fit, I think is really important. Uh, but the other piece I would say is um, to be, think very carefully about um, how you're presenting each piece that you have. Don't, don't be careful about losing a really good idea on say a chapter that might go into a volume. Um, volumes are harder to get searched. We have to think about the digital age and how articles and entries get searched, you know, picked up by search engines. And, you know, articles and journals are far more likely to be read than any chapter in a volume on average. Um, uh, certainly in a volume with prestigious editors and, and other co-authors, that might change. But titles too, similarly, I think is something that I, I didn't think enough about when I was beginning. I, I would get creative with my titles for, for the artistic sake, but straightforward, simple titles are easier to search for and probably more likely to get cited ultimately than that creative title that might work for a book once you've established yourself and people have a reason to read whatever you write anyway. But in the beginning, I think titles that help link your name to a subject or topic and brand yourself. Again, similarly to what Jimmy was saying, I think is, is what I would recommend junior scholars think about. Since most of you mentioned the idea of fit, I'm wondering if maybe this is a good way to just start some of these questions for, for novice writers. We hear that term a lot. Can you describe what that term means for you in terms of some of, and if there maybe are some aspects of fitness that aren't obvious? Uh, I'll, I'll lead off and then let my fellow panelists go. One thing is journals, most good journals describe what the scope of their journal is. Um, and uh, you should really take that seriously. Uh, in my experience, editors get annoyed by submissions that are clearly outside the parameters of the journal. Um, it, it's just a sign that someone isn't respecting you or they're throwing things at, at, at the wall to see if they stick. So read the descriptions that are on web pages or in the journals themselves about what the scope of that journal is. Word length requirements, for example, are very important. Um, we, I will you know, often throw out articles simply because they're, um, they're too long or too short, uh, honestly. Um, but the other thing I think that's important when it comes to fit is, uh, is to think about um, where 
your readers are going to be. And by that, I mean two things. So I think on, on the one hand, there's sort of, again, certain reputations about subject areas that go with certain journals. And, you know, you want to kind of affiliate your name. It's another way of branding when you think about how your article gets lumped in with a certain journal. But almost as important, maybe more important when you're a junior professor, is to be very uh, savvy about what your um, senior peers and, and, and colleagues are thinking about journals. Um, where do, what are they going to count when it comes to, to looking at your resume for tenure and promotion? Uh, the bottom line is, and I, I don't see this changing anytime soon, um, the where you put a piece matters greatly in terms of its weighting in terms uh, when it comes to tenure and promotion. You know, you can get nowadays almost anything published somewhere because there are simply some so many journals and there are journals that have high acceptance rates, you know, 30, 40 percent. Um, but the people who are going to be evaluating you know that. So I think there's just the sense of making sure that you're fitting your articles into places that are are going to get the right kind of um, uh, attention and as well as prestige. Yeah, I, I agree with um, what Remy said. Um, one thing from my experience where FIT is concerned, um, for example, uh, the online journal that I edit, uh, Study the South, um, you know, uh, oftentimes or sometimes I will get essays in that are almost purely theoretical which is great, but it's an online journal which really affords us um, the opportunities to include um, video, um, audio, a lot of images, and so and that's the kind of journal it is. Um, it's not the it's not um, uh, it, it is illustrated, whereas a lot of academic journals are not. It's purely textual. Um, and so if I get something in that just I cannot figure out how to illustrate it, um, online journals generally do not um, do great with just text, with just tons of text, with nothing but text really. Um, so yeah, so look to see if where you're trying to publish um, fits that medium as well as, um, uh, as, well as the discipline. And, and look to see who else is published there. Are these are these people? Um, you know, there's a so for example, I'm at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. There are a lot of journals out there um, uh, that talk about the South, that study in in varying ways the South, um, but not all, as as Remy has indicated, um, would would fit on a CV. Um, or apply toward uh, tenure. So look to see who else is publishing in these journals. Um, uh, and I think that will help with the idea of fit, um, definitely. Yeah, I have uh, very little to add to what uh, Remy and Jimmy have already said, except, uh, you know, I'm a big keyword person. And when we were working to promote and debut Spark, we spent a lot of time thinking about what keywords we wanted to define the journal and would hopefully attract people to submit to the journal. So activism and community engagement were the two primary keywords. And so um, we also uh, mentioned things like intersectionality, uh, coalitions and coalitional rhetoric. Um, so those are sort of the things that we wanted to target. And so I would just do you know, a cursory keyword search to see what uh, aligns with your interest in your research. Thanks. Yeah, I had um, I had a question about um, what you expect um, when an author uh, contacts you, because I feel like uh, we maybe just had slightly different vibes on, <laughs> uh, you know, how how prepared the work has to be, how much it has to fit. Um, so if you have an author who maybe not with something as trivial as word count, which they should be able to look at the uh, the journals down and see that, but um, if there is a, a younger author who um, you know, wants to contact the editor and ask questions about things like fit. Um, you know, would you be interested in this topic? 
um, you know, are my methods the kind of thing that your journal would publish? Um, how much do you, um, do you value going back and forth with authors or how much do you expect them to just, you know, kind of put together a draft and submit something that's um, fairly complete? Uh, I can start by answering that. Um, and again, I, you know, my perspective is unique because we are such a new journal, new wish. Um, but I, you know, inquiries are great and I always value a short summary, you know, like a succinct short summary of the piece or the interest. Um, and specifically, I always like to hear why an author thinks it would be a good fit or a good match for the journal overall, or you know, if we have a specific CFP that is thematic in any way. Uh, that's always really helpful for me to, you know, make those connections and have something that I can respond to specifically um, as we go back and forth chatting. Um, I just, I value a good detailed first contact that's, you know, professional nature, um, but, you know, still conversational uh, and engaging. And typically when um, I engage in an inquiry with an author, you know, it's, it's pretty short. There's not much back and forth, but uh, we're mostly talking about the different genres uh, that the journal publishes and trying to figure out what might be best uh, for the author to pursue. So that's just my perspective. Um, I'll say, well, my process generally is I would prefer to receive, and I, and I would imagine uh, this may not be true for Remy in the Southern Journal of Philosophy, but um, I would generally prefer to get um, completed manuscripts rather than ideas and then work from the ideas. Uh, I, lo I love a good abstract with the full manuscript. Um, I think that's helpful and I think a well-written abstract is extremely valuable um, for, uh, for writers and perhaps more valuable for editors. Um, there's a lot of submissions we go through. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to remember to be really um, skilled and uh, precise with our abstracts. Um, but yeah, I generally don't work from ideas. I'll, I may get an idea um, in, somebody may uh, court a journal or a publication with an idea and uh, and, and, and that's great because sometimes I can say, well, I don't know if, you know, this is the right place for you to do this work. I may have some suggestions for you and I'm always happy um, to do that. And I think a good editor often is if the fit is not right, then I do try and come up with a, a couple of suggestions where they may, um, that piece may better be a better fit. Um, but I generally don't work from, I've got an idea. Um, I, I usually say, well, let me know when you're done with it. I'd love to look, take a look at it. Um, I have a feeling, Remy, you're in the same position with the, with the journal, but, I'm, but I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it, I think again, for a, it, it probably varies a little bit by discipline, but for, for, for the scholarly journals in philosophy, and I, I think, um, uh, in say social science is probably similar. Um, there's a there's a defined process already about how manuscripts are submitted, and they need to be ready for review by the time they're submitted. Um, and most demand an abstract already. Now, certainly, if an author just wants to contact to say, you know, look, um, does this, uh, you know, this topic fit with the the boundaries? That's, that's harmless. Um, uh, what can be annoying, and you do see at times, is uh, somebody who looks like they're trying to prime you. Um, they're trying to uh, see if they, they'll gauge you already on whether you're gonna pass it through desk review or whether they need to do something to pass, get it past desk review. Um, and that's, that's really not appropriate. Um, you know, knowing, asking questions about whether an article fits within the parameters of a journal or, or some dimension of a journal. So like, for example, the Southern Journal of Philosophy has a section called Notes and Discussion, where we allow shorter pieces that either discuss previously published articles or marginalized figures and topics in, in, the, in, uh, in philosophy, even if they weren't published in our journal. And so you might 
get an, a query that says, hey, I've got this short essay on this, would this fit that that this, that section? That's, that's good and fine and, and I welcome that. But um, I think it's wrong when, I think it's inappropriate when authors try to prime editors uh, to see if they can grease the wheels a little bit in terms of the publication process. That only seems, that, that only turns me off, um, frankly, uh, from the paper. Um, but um, as Jimmy said, sometimes you do get inquiries from on bigger, on bigger picture things. Like, so uh, about a year ago, uh, an author wrote to me to say that they had run a conference on uh, the philosophy of laughter, and they were wondering whether the journal would be interested in publishing the proceedings as a special volume. That that's that's a good inquiry. It's a big idea. It's the sort of thing you can bring to an editor, and they can think through whether that would fit and whether a special issue would make sense. And certainly, I think um, that's appropriate. And that that's a sort of way of putting one foot into the editorial world. Um, if you say ran a conference and you hosted a big conference and during the conference, people started kicking around the idea, well, what if we collected all these articles and could we publish them anywhere? Approaching the editor of a journal um, to ask about that or the editor of a, a, a you know, academic publishing house, those I think are perfectly good ideas to bring to editors. They, they accept big ideas like that all the time. That's part of their job to think about whether um, their form would fit, fit an idea like that. If I could follow up on this question, because um, it speaks to, or, or I should say, this question speaks to how maybe your own strategies as scholars and writers align with some of this advice that you're sharing, and specifically this idea of submission. Um, so I teach a graduate class in writing and publishing, and one of one of the things I always, um, or one recurring a uh, situation I always encounter is with a student who is trying to get a manuscript just right before they hit submit, which is to say, I think one of the things that prevents people from publishing who don't publish, it's not that they aren't writers or they can't write, it's that anxiety that comes with hitting the submit button. So my question is about, um, again, maybe, maybe, this, maybe you can tackle this from your own processes as a writer, but also, you know, how do you give advice? How do you decide when something is good enough to submit? Because I found a lot of times, you know, journals just don't accept articles, right? Like I think a revise and resubmit is a success. So a lot of times I'm writing just to make sure I have enough of a manuscript that reviewers can tell me how to make it better. But that's such a hard metric to talk about. So I wonder if, if if you have some sort of advice or suggestions or ideas about the difference between writing a perfect manuscript and writing a manuscript that's good enough for peer review. Yeah, I actually had this come up pretty recently with a co-author. Um, we got to the point where we found ourselves splitting hairs about how certain paragraphs were organized or, you know, certain wording. And at that point, we realized we need to let the peer reviewers do their job. Um, you know, I, I always return back to what I learned as a writing center tutor, the split between higher order concerns and lower order concerns. If you find yourself really concerned about lower order concerns, it's probably time to submit, right? Um, but if it's more conceptual, organizational, uh, argumentative concerns that might be more higher order, yeah, spend some more time with it. But I, I still don't think that there's a problem, you know, writing the editor and just asking, like, you know, I, I, I want to clarify something about your style guide or your, your format, um, you know, just to ask before I submit. Um, but that's just that's my perspective. And I often have to remind myself, let the reviewers do their job. I mean, it's part of the process for a very good reason, right? Yeah, I, I, I have a similar view as Liz. Um, yeah, I think people need to trust the process. Um, I you certainly don't want to submit something that's sloppy, um, and, and by that I mean in its presentation style. It should still be in its proper uh, form for whatever the journal requires. I mean, again, as I think Jimmy pointed out, you can have very different kinds of journals, um, but say just for a standard academic journal, you, you, you want to make sure your citations are there and in order. They don't necessarily need to be all in the correct publishing style of the journal, but 
it shouldn't be messy. It can't be like insert footnote here kind of uh, levels of, 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 of preparation. That that wouldn't fly. But I, I do think that young authors need to, to trust the process. They need to know that um, getting feedback, even with a rejection, can be very helpful. And then that alone might help you uh, get it published or get that revise and resubmit on the next journal you send it to. There's, I mean, only, I don't know that there's any discipline that only has one journal that you could publish in. I think that is sometimes young authors think that that's true. That like this is the only place that I can put this, but there's there's always some other places. Um, and so trusting that process to get feedback and revise, whether it's with a rejection or an R and R, uh, is crucial to publishing. And so what I often tell young authors is, um, especially those who are starting off and are facing a tenure clock right away is, this is why it's so important to have things in the pipe as they, I, they, we often say, you need to have things in different stages, drop it in, forget about that one, wait till you hear back from the referees, don't like worry about it anymore. Uh, and then focus on another one, drop that one in the shoot. When that one gets in the shoot, the first one might be coming back. And you know, you, you, you wanna build this, this layering process that trusts that you'll be getting feedback and then you'll be re revising from feedback. And if you get seized up on perfectionism over the one piece, by the time you get that one in place, three years will be by and you know, you're know you not gonna have enough time to get the, the five, six or seven or whatever you need for tenure. Yeah, I, I thought, I agree with all of that. Um, also think that we've got resources at our disposal here in our own institutions. Um, you know, I, I think for young scholars, uh, from for any book that gets published, we've got readers who, who, you know, or or articles for um, journals that we have um, our colleagues read um, and respond to before we even get to the point of hitting that send button. And I think that's important because those are people who are within the field, um, know the literature, know um, if you're making an argument that someone's already made that perhaps you have not read before or encountered, um, or if just there is some some flaw in the in the logic or in the organization of the piece or the book. Um, so yeah, I, I really I really encourage people to share work amongst themselves within departments um, and perhaps across departments. Uh, the Center for the Study of Southern Culture is interdisciplinary, um, but that never hurts uh, as long as the, your reader understands um, where you want to publish it and what you're trying to do with that particular piece. Um, and I do, I do agree also with Remy. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, study the South. Uh, we, our um, formatting is Chicago. Um, and I would recommend um, having the, use it working within the citation format that the journal uses and not asking the journal to convert footnotes from MLA to Chicago if you ever want it pub if you ever want to see it in print or you know published um, because that takes a lot of work and a lot of time and if you're lucky enough to have them do it um, you will be unlucky enough to have that one put on the back burner because it will take that much more work oftentimes editors will do that um, or have um, an editorial assistant do that but you don't want anyone doing that work for you. That's the kind of work that we as, as scholars and as writers need to be able to do ourselves. Um, wow, I, I, that's never even occurred to me to ask a journal to change my citations for me. That's a great idea. No, <laughs> I mean, literally never even occurred to me. That's asking a lot. <laughs> yeah. I had, a, uh, I had one concrete thing that I thought I might add on this line of thought. I think that... Um, because part of Will, Will, your question was how how um, how polished does it need to be to, to get to the stage of review? I think the opening is really important. Um, so as an editor, I, I don't read every submission top to bottom before I decide it's ready for desk, you know, for, for full review, um, not just to send it out to referees. But the openings are, are crucial, right? And I think that 
young authors stumble a lot around openings in one of two ways. They either um, forget to take the time to do a little bit of situation and, and make clear where their paper is falling into, uh, you know, whatever debate it is, is taking place. And I don't mean that always needs to be done um, in the body of the paper, but even with some just really keen footnotes that make clear that it's touching, it's in this conversation here or there. But the other in problem I see, and I think I see more uh, often, is that authors don't get to their point incisively. So there's, they're too long. It takes too long to figure out what the paper is about. And uh, this makes it hard for, a refer for, for, not for referees, but for the desk editor for, who is who's trying to decide where, whether this is ready to go out. If I can't figure out within a couple pages what a paper is about, then that suggests to me that the author still themselves is not sure what it's really about. I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, one of my advisors was David Bellman, who's a well-known philosopher, uh, then at Michigan, now at NYU. And uh, I, when I wrote my first big piece for him, I remember I walked into his office when we sat down to meet about it and talk about it. And he said, you know, this is this is really, really interesting, Remy. I, I like this. I should say I really, really like this the second two thirds. The first third, you could just cut it right out. He said, I understand that you needed to think through that material to get to the two thirds, but we don't need to think through it with you. Right? We don't need all that stage setting. And so I think that kind of self editing where an author goes back and re you know, re-examines the opening paragraphs, opening pages, and thinks, how much of it this am I saying because I had to think through it to get to here versus this is how, what I need to say to just launch the argument, launch the paper. Um, that would be probably a, a bit of concrete advice I would give authors. Great, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions now from the audience? Um, so if you wanted to um, unmute yourself um, and, and ask a question, whether or not you put on your video, now is the time. Otherwise, Will and I have a million other questions. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Okay, so I have done, uh, and Will knows my story, so I responded to a CFP uh, for a book series because my dissertation fits in there quite nicely and it's about the rhetoric of social movements. So I sent, you know, the explanation of how it fits in and where it fits in with extant scholarship and all this kind of stuff. And it's pretty timely in light of all that's going on in our culture. So I got a response from the managing, I mean, the acquisition editors saying, yes, we're very interested. Um, I'll get you in touch with the managing editor in the month of October. Well, it's almost November and I've not heard. So what do you suggest that I do to kind of go, hey, I'm still out here, you know, or do I just, does this just proceed at a glacier's pace? You know, so I'd appreciate your input on that. Well, if I'm happy to comment on that. Um, if you were told that you will hear something in October, respond to that particular email that has that bit of information in it okay. and just I, I, I there's I I don't know of any editors who would um, be put off by that um, if if November gets here uh, maybe not November 1st maybe November 2nd or 3rd well maybe later on that week um, but yeah I, I don't there's I don't see anybody ever having a problem with that I, I as an editor don't Oftentimes, you know, we're all really busy, um, and I'm sure that uh, publishing houses as well. Um, but um, just to say, hey, um, I don't know, however you would like to word it, I don't see that being a problem at all. Um, Great. You know, no, not at all. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Just wait till October is actually over. Okay. Uh, if it said within October, then don't don't do it before October is over, um, because people sometimes really do hold themselves to the last minute. Uh, editors, I think, count on those those, those dates. Uh, but yeah, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with it. And uh, the other thing is, I would say just assume best intentions, because the breakdown could have occurred somewhere else in the chain. They might have forwarded your name just like they said, 
-hmm. and then maybe the managing editor didn't get back to you and so your reminder will help this the this you know series editor say oh okay that's interesting i did write to them let me let me follow up you know and who knows for all you know fingers crossed it's not true the managing editor could have had COVID, right i mean so yeah yeah uh, true. i mean i always think that we work on our best intentions um and assume that whatever the breakdown is has nothing to do with you per se uh and that will that that will help structure the way you write your emails in ways that come off as inviting and charitable right thank you i also think that it's okay for the reason that um most i i should i think most journals um or or uh, publishers um ask that this manuscript not be um, submitted elsewhere while they do that review. And so it's only fair um, that if, if for some reason they're kind of on the fence about it, that um, they should let people know so they can resubmit somewhere else. Because most people do follow that guideline and say, well, I'm not going to submit this, particularly for books. Yeah. If it's, if it's gotten to a particular, if it's gotten to the point where they're um, sent, planning on sending it out, it costs a lot of money to um, hire a reader and so forth. Um, so that's why they ask, you know, people not to send them out uh, multiple submissions. And so it's only fair to you as, as, as a writer as well, that um, you get a timely response. Yeah, well, that's the thing. They wanted to know where I'd been published. And so I'm like, yeah, part of it got published in Spark, but it was only, you know, 2,500 words or whatever, you know. And so uh, meanwhile, I had the nerve to apply for a grant and out of an abundance of confidence, I'm just thinking, well, what am I going to do if I get it? Now, if I do get the grant, then I'll have to find somewhere to really publish a book. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm wasting these months waiting for them because this has been going on since September. And so I guess I'll just wait until November and see what happens. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, if not, Will, do you have one final question? Uh, I, I guess, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious real fast. I mean, um, do you think uh, the, uh, do you think publishing is getting easier in the sense, uh, or maybe not easier, but do you think the the proliferation of journals, so ones like uh, Liz's journal, I mean, like, is this, um, you know, Remy, you, you said that like, there, there's always somewhere to publish your work. I mean, um, is part of the work just doing the research and figuring out those places? Is that, is that, is that, is that the work that, is that mean more imperative now for those of us who, who want to be publishing scholars? I definitely think so. And I, I'm speaking from the field of writing studies, but it seems like looking at now as opposed to 10 years ago, there are many more journals um, and they're mostly digital journals. I mean, there are smaller digital journals. There are a few, you know, print based journals, but it's become a lot more time consuming to research, you know, the options, which I think is a blessing, um, but it can be difficult to really find what might be a good outlet. Um, it's definitely an interesting uh, conundrum, I think, because yes, more journals, um, more opportunities to publish, but yeah, which one's right? Um, which one is, you know, up and running? How does it work with my timeline, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I, I would agree, but I, I would come back to the caveat of checking in with your senior colleagues about um, what they're going to view favorably as a venue of publication. So. It's getting easier to publish, but um, it, that doesn't mean that your, your colleagues are going to accept every opportunity to publish as one worth uh, or, or that will count towards something like tenure. Um, you know, uh, and you have to be pragmatic in those earlier years. So, you know, if, if what we're doing is partly addressing younger uh, publishers, then they need to think very pragmatically about that. Um, for example, um, in my field, public facing essays, um, while they're cool and everybody sort of likes that it might draw attention to you and the university or your department, uh, in the end of the day, you could never make tenure 
off of that unless you were i mean we're talking you were publishing in really big name public facing venues you know you know if you're putting out pieces in the atlantic and new yorker then then maybe but um you know so you you don't want to spend your energy on publishing just anywhere uh this i think goes hand in hand with what liz said you know do your research and know you know 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 what the venue is and know how people are going to view that venue um, before you put your time into it because you know even if it's a small venue if it's a good idea you can't e easily cannibalize that idea um that place has you might might have copyrights on it once you publish with them you're not going to be able to necessarily take that idea or the words that you use to express it and then just put it into a bigger place just because you find out it, it you know people like it so you've got to be still thinking cautiously about how you how you place your best ideas i agree with both liz and remy on that and i, and I think it's a very good point though to perhaps end with um if that's where we're at it um yeah you might want to make sure that where you are publishing that you will have it, particularly if you're looking at um uh you're publishing a book chapter what will and um at some point become a book chapter making sure that you will be able to use that material later most most publications will allow that they're happy for you to do that because it you know they wind up getting um footnoted or um uh, mentioned in um, the acknowledgments or, 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 or in the copyright. So, um, but it's not a bad idea to check if, if you think you're going to need to repurpose that for, for book publication, uh, to check that out with that journal. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I guess it's 2 p.m. already, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much um, to our panelists. And please, uh, if the audience will join me in thanking everyone. Um, so this was our last um, Marcus Orr Center for the Humanities event of this semester. Um, but next semester, we will have more of these new meetings. Um, so thank you guys so much for um, closing out our semester on such a positive note. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Nice conversation. Yeah, Good to you. meet everyone. Thank